Hello everyone, Derek Floyd here. Welcome to another segment of Chasing the Impossible. Do you remember the time when DJs were like this local hero on the block? When it was in New York, 1980s, and everybody wanted to be a DJ. Scratch, scratch. Wanted to make great music. Wanted to move the floor, make everybody dance. Those were the days, right? Remember the track Rocket from Herbie Hancock, who was scratching on that record? Well, my special guest just happens to be that very DJ, who was one of the most influential hip-hop artist pioneers of all time. And he stopped by to share his journey with you today. But before I get to him, you know what you gotta do. If you enjoy this content you see here, please hit us with a like or a subscribe to the channel. This lets me get the most updated content to you as soon as it's available. And of course, all of our segments are always powered by and brought to you by IK Multimedia and Lewitt Microphones. Now, as I said before, this DJ is one of the most influential hip-hop pioneer legends of all time. He was one of the first people to actually use a turntable as an instrument, just like he did in Rocket with Herbie Hancock. And he brought his exclusive style to so many other artists along the way that he has definitely become a legend. And if you're fond of the 80s like me, remember all the good times we had behind the DJ and the turntable, then you're definitely going to want to hear this story. So sit back, relax, and let's hear from the man himself, Grand Mixer DXT. DXT, you there, brother? I'm here, my brother. What's happening? There he is. What's happening, my man? It's all good, man. Trying to stay up in the midst man, of... Man, good to see you, brother. You staying safe? Trying to. Man, I'm I mean, New York, to, that man. COVID thing is madness out there. It's... I don't understand it. I'm trying. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I'm I, glad I, you're I, safe, man. Yeah. You know, hey, I've turned into a farmer, brother. <laughs> I know you have. You grow your I own stuff. Not, I know you've been talking about that for a minute. Yeah, I do not leave the premises. So, I'm, yeah. <laughs> man, I should do appreciate you stopping by the program, man, because, you know, we've been friends for a long time, but folks don't really know the legend that you are, the pioneer you are. And I wanted to tell a little bit of your story, most people can really get it, because we can't leave history behind. We got to go forward, right? That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, like I said in the intro, man, you know, you are a legend a pioneer, part of hip hop history for that for that matter. And, you know, I think when I think about what you've done and how you've changed the game, I want people to know, okay, he's done so much, but what's the most important part of the career for you? What makes the what means the most to you that what you've done over these last few years? Um I, I think that the, the most important thing is to look back and know that there's more to do and I'm able to do it. And I'm able to do more. Mm -hmm. That's that's the most important thing. There's no one thing that I focus on. I, I think the, each step and each uh, accomplishment is just a step to a, a greater thing to who and where I need to be. I like it. I like it. I mean, I think about what you've done being a turntable list. I mean, you've been you've been the first on many things. Is there a part of your career that you feel like, man, this was the pinnacle? This was what I really wanted to do? Or was it all encompassed in what you are? You know, I, I, I remember, look back, standing on the stage at the Grammy Awards and looking into the audience. We just won for best uh, instrumental performance. And I'm looking at Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie and James Brown and Kashif. Earth, Wind, and Fire, Bubbles. That was a joke. And, uh, <laughs> I thought about that. Like, you talking about the monkey dude? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only you would bring and, up the and, monkey, bro. I got love for yeah, you. Okay? And, and, and I was saying to myself that, you know, I got to go back to the hood after this. Mm. You know, and what I need to take back to the hood is, is the... What I need to take back to the hood is the fact that that's where I came from. So it's not just me, it's any of us. It's what you reach for. Mm. It's what you strive for. And, mm. I, and I, I recognized at that moment that I was an example of overcoming the obstacles, sticking to what your dreams are and reaching for them. And I was, mm. I was hoping that when um, People saw me from my neighborhood on TV that that represented the, the possibilities for them as well. Man, I love that. I love that. I mean, which brings me to the next question in a way. You know, you, you came from the street, man. You came from New York. 
what were some of the, the DJs that you looked up to and, and why'd you look up to them? Like who were some of your influences? Well, I have a few. My, my first influence to make me even think about being a DJ were two DJs from my neighborhood. It was a, a group called TNT Disco. That's Tony O'Gara and a, a brother named Fat Tommy. That's what we called him. And um, they were the first DJs. I, I, you know, I really got to see them, what they were doing and playing records outside. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood where it was mostly live bands playing outside. So that was the first time we saw, you know, at people playing records outside, uh, out other than in the backyard with one turntable at a, a party, you know, mm. a, a house party. And but DJs then, were, they were the heroes back then. DJ, local DJs were the heroes in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? They, they, they became that over time. Mm. But the, then, then the, the next phase was the, the bigger DJs. And so I, there were two, and that was uh, DJ Smoke, uh, Smokey from the Master Plan Bunch, and then ultimately Koo Hurt and, uh, and that crew, who people refer to now as the Herculoids, which was Koo Hurt. And it was, it was a Koo Hurt party where he battled Smokey is when it was the deciding factor for me that um, this was something that I, I was going to go full force in. And at the time, mind you, I'm a drummer, right? So all through <laughs> beginning, I'm a drummer until I, I put my drumsticks down for a minute after going to Cool Herc's parties. I said, you know what? I'm going to get into it. I started shedding like a drummer, you know. On the, on I always the, forget uh, you're a drummer first, man. I always forget that. <laughs> I mean, that's part of why you're so good with rhythm and how you hear and how you match up that, that groove because you're, you, already, you have auto rhythm in your spirit. You got that from the game. Hey, 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 remember that uh, at the, with, uh, what was that, NAMM show? Where I was uh, playing at seven, <laughs> and beat in seven, and no one can figure out the time. Mm -mm -mm. You know? I do remember, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nate, Nathan was trying to catch it. Nathan Eats. <laughs> yeah, he's a great, he's a great musician too. Nathan Eats, great guy. Wow, one of the baddest, one of the baddest, one man. of the be one of the best. That was yeah, fun. man, yeah. yeah. So, you know, coming from the hood and, and being a, a, a dropping the needle DJ in the beginning, just, you know, dropping off with turntables and making it work. How do you feel about like the new technology of DJ where they got these, these you know, the electronic turntables and mixers and it's kind of like, you know, they got software, Ableton Live, all this new stuff that wasn't around when real DJs were doing it back then. Do you feel like this technology moves the, the genre forward or is it making it? more like too easy like it's just not making it what it needs to be well I, I, I put it this way you know for me I'm you know I used turntables and so that's how I trained and honed my skills and shed it with turntables and so that's my craft was based on that use my my motor skills and muscle memory is based off of that technology um, when if there's new technology that comes along and people are introduced into DJing based on that new technology, then that's what it is for them. Mm. So if they're doing what they need to do based on the technology that, that they're working with from their beginning, you know, it could, it could have been I was the guy using the digital stuff, mm. but it wasn't that's true. Bennett yet. So I, I can't, you know what I'm saying? I can't. Gauge That's a good way to think better. about it. Yeah, I, I'm working with what I had, and they're working with what's available today. Because some people you know? think that some of the purists are like, oh, they're not really making music. They're not turntable, and they've got this electronics. But you, being one of the pioneers, <laughs> if you're saying, hey, that's just the tools they were given, that's what they did, what they learned. And that, that's a kind of cool way to think about it. I appreciate that. Yeah, and, and, they, and they have the, the opportunity to go back to uh, use the older technology um, if they choose to. And just like some of the older DJs who used only the older technology, they have the option of using the new technology. I mean, we started off with, you know, home stereos, you know, <laughs> then, then we got the techniques and, the, and those techniques had, were belt driven. And then they went to di uh, direct drive. And so we went through that process also. Wow. See what I'm saying? Wow. That's so, so yeah, cool. It is, it, 
yeah, we're in that line of, of uh, you know, advancing technology as well. I'm, you know, I was on a home stereo system. On the home the stereo. Eject button. Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> and so you can't, you know, that the, the purest thing is, is not pure. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, you, you look, look back, back, though, at the early yeah. days, what you were doing, you mm -hmm. know, when you were creating music with a turntable, like I said, one, like they, they call you the first real turntablist. When you were doing that, did you feel like, man, I'm making history? Or did you just feel like I'm just having fun? I'm, I'm doing what I love to do and I'm just going to keep doing it. I mean, what did it feel like? Well, the whole, the whole position and approach to what became known as turntable. And let me just say this so that all of the people who are DJs in the DJ world and use that term, the term is being misused as, and that's, it's, and that's me saying it from the understanding of its origin. Mm. Um, if you are a scratch DJ and you're DJing, you're scratching at parties and stuff, you're a DJ, you're a scratch DJ. If you're a battle DJ, you're a battle DJ. What mm. the term turntable is, uh, was coined, why it was coined by Herbie Hancock was to explain that there are, this guy here is using the turntable as part of a music ensemble and he's mm. actually playing in the band. Mm. Uh, as a musician, as a virtuoso uh, with his instrument. And so I couldn't stand the term at first, and I didn't <laughs> want to use it. And I said, man, I'm a DJ. And he was like, I'm a pianist. Wayne Brathwaite is a bassist. Mm -hmm. You're a turntablist. And it took me a while. I, I, I never... I really... love that. Never thought about that way. That's, a, that's perfect. <laughs> I love it. Love yeah, it. and so now people are just using it because they're DJing, but that's not it. If you, there mm. are other cats who play their turntables in bands, like the Scratch Pickles, they mm. Cubert and uh, Mixmaster Mike and uh, a few of them guys. They they are turntablers because that's they wow. they actually can do that. But not many people are actually turntablers. That's one of the things I'm going to try to help people understand. It's just like a jazz bassist. A, a, a funk basis, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. same thing applies to use your how you use your turntables. Yeah, and yeah. so that's wisdom. That's so, wisdom. I like that. I like that. I like that. Hey, so I said, I said, um, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Go ahead. Oh, okay, it, it, I did a record called Crazy Cuts, and hmm. I said in the beginning of it, late one night in the Boogie Down Bronx. The grand mixer was working hard, trying to, I used the word invent, which was incorrect. It should have mm -hmm. been innovate. Trying mm -hmm. to innovate new forms of scratching so that the elevation of hip hop could continue. Mm -hmm. So I knew what I was doing was going to change on how the trends flow in the hood based on what you do and what you bring to the table, how it would affect everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that that would have an impact on um on the culture mm. the, every every time you went to a party especially if there was a a, a very good dj in the, playing at night you was expecting you would expect to see or hear something that would make you go home and practice wow and so wow. as a, as a musician i was used to shedding all the time and wow. so that was my discipline from you know playing with older musicians all the time I had no choice, mm. you know, and mm. so that was already in there. So I, I started shedding and I started thinking of Ella, Miles, you know, Ornette. Yeah, man. Mm. See, you, you've always had a taste for the jazz, the jazz uh, genre, man. That's just been yeah, it. Yeah, well, my mom had a, an incredible collection of records. And so she had mm. Lou Donaldson, Tito Puente. I grew up with everything. And so all of that was my, uh, you know, my ammunition and my resources of ideas to approach uh, the turntables. And wow. as a drummer. I, I love that. I love that. And see, so you're, you're talking mm -hmm. because you're letting people know that you were not just some dude with a turntable and a needle trying to make records. You were actually a musician, an artist, and you were taking in the sounds and transforming that, innovating that into almost to a new subculture, a new genre. And People don't get that, but, but and we don't get to innovate as much anymore. I feel like we just do the same old thing. I, I miss the times of innovation, like when you were doing what you were doing. And all those records that your mom had, man, you, you soaked it up. 
And that's what made you DXT. You know, that's what made you different, right? Yeah, I came from a, a music world. My mother's a singer. I, you know, aunts and uncles, musicians. Grandmother was a musician. And um, so it was just natural for me to follow suit. I got my first drum set. I was, it, it was one of those with the, the pitch of the Beatles on the bass head. You know, that's how... <laughs> I, wow. I think I was about four or five years old, you know. <laughs> so nice. I, I was, yeah. They, she started me early. <laughs> so, so here's the here's yeah. the go back throwback question. With all that great music going on, with all that that influence to the greats, um, when did you actually learn how to scratch or how to really work a turntable? What, was there like a time you just started off all by yourself? You just fell in love with it. When did that even start? How'd you practice well, the technique? Well, here's the deal. Um, you know, as when I I got my first turntable, I, I got a job at McDonald's. Uh, my my close friend, he's like we grew up together. Uh, his name is Carter Allen. We call him Mr. C. And um, he got me my first job at McDonald's. You know, mm. I was running around going crazy, <laughs> and so. You know, I was in McDonald's and I was telling everybody, hey, man, I'm, I'm going to be in show business. And they were like, yeah, I right. shut up and turn the <laughs> I was like, no, for real, man, I'm just in here so I can get my turntables. <laughs> and um, so it took me about six months working at McDonald's to buy one turntable for $60. Oh, my goodness. Hey, yeah, man, it's just, just a matter. <laughs> it was and tough so, for you down there. It was tough. <laughs> right. So I, I would take the turntable. I was so happy when I got it. I brought it home. <laughs> took it out the box, set it all up. I didn't have nothing to plug it into. I just plugged it in the wall, turned it on. No records, no nothing. Just stare. <laughs> no needle, no nothing. No cartridge, no nothing. I just, <laughs> wow. just watched it turn. <laughs> and I was just thinking. I would just stare at it for hours, thinking, 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 thinking. And remember, I'm also, I'm listening to music. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. And so as a musician, you always find yourself uh, uh, verbalizing uh, changes in a song or rhythm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So mm. I would sit there and go back, 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 back. So I started thinking of all of that stuff. Mm. And then when um, it became fashionable to cue out loud, which the, that credit is given to my brother, Grand Wizard Theodore. Mm. And so scratching is actually cueing. Every DJ who is conscious of timing cues the record so he'll, he can be on time. And mm. so even in the disco clubs and the dance music, those DJs cue the record so they can blend it in on time. Nice. But sometimes you make an accident with the fader and you mm -hmm. cue out loud. Oh, wow. So, no, you, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, okay. Grand Wizard Theater made it fashionable to cue, to cue out, out loud. loud. <laughs> okay. Right. And I love it became it. called scratching, it. but it's actually cueing <laughs> out loud. And I so, once it. that was, once it was fashionable, you know, everyone started trying to, you know, bring their technique. But you know, the one thing about hip hop was the, for the first few weeks or so of someone innovating or bringing something new to the table, that would be the stable uh, uh, replication of it. You know, you, mm. would, you, would, you would not enhance it in any way. And mm. for me, I always wanted to be different. Mm. And so the moment, I, the moment that I, I heard that, that it was okay, you know, um, you know, my, my whole musician thing. The whole world me. changed. Yeah. And, and, and I started shedding and, you know, th there were, there were catastrophic mistakes and beautiful <laughs> mistakes. And so I held on to the beautiful mistakes and I tried to rework the catastrophic mistakes <laughs> so, so, so they could make sense. But all, it. yeah, all of the attempts uh, found their way in, um, in the play, in the actual performance. It. Um, it. it was a matter of me finding what time signatures to put them in for them to make sense. And so well, it you, was beautiful you, mistakes. And you bringing up mistakes, because right. mistakes is something, you did it perfectly. You're saying, I took the mistakes and worked them in and made them beautiful. I hear the word right. mistake or obstacle a lot with people that have been successful on their planet. And most of them will tell me, 
okay, it, there you learn a lot more from the mistakes you've made than you do from you know all the the accolades and wins. Because there's you know you you got to learn how to pick yourself up. You learn the actual lessons. Can you give me maybe one or two, maybe one lesson that you feel like, man, I, I missed it here. I fell here. There was an obstacle here. I mistake here in your life that you felt like, man, this taught me to be a better DXT. Oh, uh, one night, one night I was on my way to a, uh, to another group, local group that was doing a party. And, uh, you know, I wanted to go and, and, you know, wish them luck. And cause I was a celebrity, you know, local celebrity and all the DJs looked up to me. So I wanted to go and, um, just tell them, have a good party, you know, do your thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to check you guys out, you know, and I never made it inside. Um, uh, I was approached by gunmen mm. and, um, at the end of, at the, when it was all over, they had robbed me for, I had this big DST gold medallion, <sighs> oh. jewelry, a couple uh. of grand in my pocket. Uh. And so when I got to my house, I told my brother what happened. And uh, so he, he got up and he said, all right, let's go. And he handed me a firearm. Mm. He had mm. one. And I was so upset that uh, one of the we I knew we knew who it was instantly. People came and told me immediately who it was, mm. and um, I went to out of anger, you know. Mm. We found one of the one of their brothers, and I, I went at him crazy, you know. Mm. I, I, I I was about to shoot him actually, mm. and um, mm. I caught myself, you know. And the next day, I went to his house and asked him to forgive me. Mm. And uh, now here's the here's the, the spin on that. You know, I asked him to forgive me, and then within about seven days, I I went to Brooklyn to record Rocket. <laughs> and I did that scratch solo in one take. Mm. Because I was I was deeply hurt. I was devastated by that. But it taught me a lesson. Um, and it took a while for it to kick in. But I didn't need none of that stuff. None of that material stuff is what mm. got me to where I was. Mm. None of it. I needed my skills and my understanding of what righteousness is mm. and my purpose mm. of sharing uh, my abilities and and using my talent to show others that they can also do it and wow. reach for the stars yeah. uh, and so uh, that was that was the lesson because shortly after that you know herbie wins his first grammy so mm -hmm. you know we win the first first time for me first time for mm -hmm. him one take mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. and that could have mm -hmm. been one shot yeah wow Wow, that, that's saying? amazing, and that and you learned, and you learned that lesson, and it changed your life. Changed my changed life. life. I, I actually thank those guys now mm. because I didn't. Mm -hmm. I thought the material thing meant something to me, and it took me a while to realize that no, that they came for a reason. Wow, wow. to help me to see that uh, I didn't need none of that. Wow. That's a great story, and as, as always, you know, things like that, like people that are successful tell me there's always a pivotal moment where you learn, and you obviously, that was a pivotal moment in your planet, and um, man, I just, I think no, Absolutely, I, I, I would not that. be sitting here today if I would have made the other decision. Wow, uh, I wow. just, I'd just be, I'd just be coming home or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, yeah. I, I, I thank them that, mm. you know, mm. I thank well, you. Them. you you also mentioned the pivotal moment, which was Rocket, which I was going to go right into. Uh, you know, that is an iconic song, an iconic track, a, a, a moment in history that blended genres. I mean, and when you were doing that, when Herbie, wa when you walked into the studio with Herbie and he said, let's do this, did you have any idea that it was going to change the culture the way you did? No, no. Um, 
like I said, I went to Brooklyn. I took a cab from Eden Wall Projects in the Bronx to Brooklyn that day to record that. Uh, Mr. C was with me. <clears throat> and uh, Herbie wasn't even there. It was myself. It was the material was the production company I was part of. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Beinhorn, Bill Laswell, and um, Daniel Ponce uh, was the played Bata on that record. <laughs> and um, I went in there and did my parts. And, uh, you know, that came from my mind. You know, I went in there just putting my own ideas onto the track. Wow. You know, and that's, wow. that's what we all did. Every Everyone put their own two cents on that track. Of course, I was the only person in the known universe at the time doing that. So no one. Right. Else. That's what I'm saying. You were, you were iconic even before you started it, but to know right. so that, how it, that it changed. Really, right. It was based on whatever I was chose to do. And um, that uh, particular performance was based on where I was. Um, I was angry and I, I was trying to reconnect myself to what my cause is and my purpose is mm. and so i went there and said this is what i do mm. so so you so your your hardest lesson brought you your greatest triumph absolutely and and i tell people this and i've heard it my pastor says it all the time pastor Stephen verdict big shout um he said you're it within your greatest adversity is your greatest opportunity and Absolutely. You you took that greatest adversity in your planet, and you're like, "Well, I'm gonna change this into something. This is your shot to be bigger than that adversity." And you did it. And it, now you this is I you were already a legend, but this takes it to the next level. So you know, blessings on sharing that story. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, it, it is what it is, man. And again, I I, I think the whole situation worked out for me. Yeah, uh, it taught yeah, me a great yeah. lesson in life that I can share with uh other people. Mm, mm. So knowing, you know, you've been around some of the greats, man. I know you had a love for jazz. Uh, how did the Herbie Hancock connection even come to be? How'd you meet him? How did that even start it? Well, I was the DJ at the biggest club in New York. It was called the Roxy's. <laughs> and uh, it had became the number one spot for celebrities. And it used to be a roller skating rink. And um, I was playing there and people started approaching me for all kind of gigs and traveling all around the world. And a gentleman by the name of Bernard Zekri, uh Tunisian, a brother from Tunisia, <clears throat> he approached me and he, he said uh, he was working with a guy named Jean Caracos. And they were starting a record label and they were interested in doing some music and business with me. Uh, they said there were some other people involved, uh, being Bill Laswell and Michael Byhorn. And they said, we're going to have a dinner party and we'd like for you to attend so you can meet Caracos and discuss business. And um, I said, cool. So I'm thinking, well, here's my opportunity to get my drum game back on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, because, you know, I'm sitting around musicians most of my life. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm you know, I'm good to go. You itching and, to play. Um, you itching to play them drums. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm saying, okay, let me get it. I got to start shedding and stuff. And so, <laughs> um, and so I go to this party. And um, in that conversation, um, uh, Bill says to me that, uh, oh, by the way, um, we met with, um, do you know, do you know who Herbie Hancock is? I said, absolutely. I'm, it's one of my heroes. And he says, well, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're submitting some demos. We met with his manager and they're looking for demos. And, um, you know, would you be interested in participating in that? So that's one of the projects that we we're working on as part of this new company we're forming here. And, um, you, you, you're welcome to join in. And so, most of the work I did was just with Bill and Michael Beinhorn. Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, I, I didn't meet Herbie until after I did everything I did. Wow. Really? <laughs> you didn't meet him yeah, he was, after you did your work? He was blown away. <laughs> and so, so I, had, I had to go out and do some business in L.A. anyway. 
Mm-hmm. And um, I, uh, I went to the studio a few times when we were out in L.A., but Herbie wasn't there those days. Mm-hmm. And then finally, I had some shows on Sunset Strip. And uh, I, was, I did those gigs. Matter of fact, I brought Grandmaster Kaz with me. <laughs> and then um, I was leaving that day. And that's the day I went to Herbie's house. Uh, Tony Mylan, uh Herbie's manager, brought me over there to meet Herbie. And I bought my first 12 inch that I made. And I bought it to give it to him. And then I just sat with him for about an hour or two. Just wow. talking. And he was like, man, how did you, how did you think to do that, man? Like, how? And he, and he still didn't actually see it yet, you know? <laughs> wow. And so he was like, man, how did you think to 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 come up with that idea and i said well right you know i was thinking uh, of uh ella and scatting and because i would do that anyway mm-hmm. and so you know I, i'm a musician so i would sit there and you know pretend i'm playing a sax solo or something and play it through a, a particular section of a song and mm-hmm. so i just applied that to the turntable you know, I, think, uh, uh, I mean, uh, let, let me ask you a better question. Let me ask you a better question. How important were those collaborations to forwarding the genre of hip hop? Because at one point, they didn't even exist at that point. That at the you are working with Herbie Hancock, creating a whole new subspace. Now it's the whole new blend of hip hop and jazz. Yeah, what it did was that performance opened the door to cross genre collaborations. Because hip hop is, in many ways, it is jazz. Mm. You know, it's funk. It's 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 genreless, so it can be <laughs> whatever it wants to be. Um, um, what a lot of people don't understand is is what I just said. I mean, if you can you can apply it to any so called genre, and I say so called because hip hop is genreless. It, mm. it, when we used to look for records, we looked in every so-called genre you can find, from Beethoven mm-hmm. to Bob Marley, um, mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. in a in a in a hip hop DJ's record collection. And so, again, it, it, for me, it was it was easy. And you know, there's a lot of DJs who were drummers. Um, Imperial yeah. JC is a drummer. Mm-hmm. Uh, original Jazzy J is a drummer. Mm-hmm. And so, and they had these record collections based on the same approach and understanding that I have as a musician, because they were musicians. And they are two of the better, uh, as far as timing and precision, uh, DJs. And that comes from the, the, the mechanics, the physical I mechanics of being a, a drummer and applying it. Because, you know, doing this, you know, this is still my snare hand, my left hand, <laughs> you know. And right, so, right. You know, that's that's the mixer <laughs> most of the time. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, doing this yeah. is my ride, you know? So mm. it, I, I go from here to here. <laughs> you know? I love and so it. It, it. Yeah, so it's... it's it's uh, And so that, that's why people like Nardo, Michael Walden, came up to me and he said, man, you're a drummer. You're a drummer. You don't even have to tell me. I can tell. And I say, <laughs> Prince, wow. same thing. Prince. Prince was like, I can tell you play drums. Mm. And they said, it's your timing is, you would not think that a person can do that and be that precise uh, with a record. I love it. I love it. I love it, man. (laughs) And you've met some of the greats along the way, which has been such a huge blessing. Um, I I think the phenomena itself is what drew that attention because they all wanted to see, like, what is that and how is he doing that? Mm -hmm. And... um, even Quincy uh, came to a rehearsal, didn't say nothing, just pulled the chair up, spun it around, <laughs> sat down and said, okay, uh, let's see it. And I looked at Herbie and he said, don't look at me. <laughs> 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 and so we, 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 did, we did rock it. And, wow. and he, he said to me, he said, man, uh, that is going to change everything. Mm-hmm. Those were his and words. it did. Miles, <laughs> and it yeah, did. Miles said the same thing, man. You know, mm. I was terrified mm. to meet Miles. 
Miles Davis, so everybody, many. you know. It, yeah, <laughs> gotta clarify. Everybody said, don't know who Miles is. I know, but everybody don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, Miles Davis is the, the, like one of the greatest musicians in the, in our history, mm -hmm. uh, trumpet player, um, and he uh, he said the same thing. Man. He said, uh, "You realize that that's going to change music wow. forever. Wow. It's going to change." So, so knowing that you've been a legend, a pioneer, iconic in this space as a DJ, as a musician, as an artist, as a producer. Where do you see the art form of the DJ going forward 2021? Where do you see them doing it? Are they all going to be like you or is it just a new form of DJ emerging for the next few years? Well, a couple of things happened. One is the technology changed so the shedding process was more based on, um, I won't say copying other people, but the, the inspiration came from a small network of performances. And so most of the people you see doing, you know, doing scratch techniques, they're all very similar. And so I would call that the basics because everyone's doing it. So as long as, long as that's what's happening. It's it's become this basic thing because you, to you have to go out of that to <laughs> make it something special. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, That's like mm -hmm. every bass player playing the same notes, right? And so, and so it's become a basic thing, and uh, most of the DJs are not approaching it from a turntablist perspective mm. because they would know I need to expand my ideas here. Mm -hmm. I need to go beyond what everyone else is playing. And I just so happened to have been working on something uh, for a few years now because I had noticed this circle of repetition for quite some time. And so I, and, and hopefully uh, by the end of this year, I can unveil another chapter to turntablism. Turntablism. But what I'm going to do is I'm not raising the bar. I'm lowering it. <laughs> what? So your limbo game oh, is wow. going to have to get crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Only you, That's bro. all I'm going to say. Only you. Only you. Only you. Yeah, and I, 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 I can't even do... imagine. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you a little something in, in, in when we get a chance. Okay. Okay. You know, okay. A, a lot of these cats are probably going to just quit. And so some of them will just keep doing what they're doing. <laughs> And then some will go, wow, next level for the next generation. I don't, you know, if you, if you, did, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but my generation did not follow suit. Right. The generation that followed what's called turn turntablism and that style of scratching mm -hmm. where it goes out from the basics, mm -hmm. that was the next generation, because wow. again, the the muscle memory, the mm -hmm. whole brain uh, 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 process of that was done. By the, by the older generation, they did not adapt to the next phase because they were already locked into how they communicate with their instrument. And it's mm. it's literally that way. So, you know, you got to shed. And some mm. only the ones that were able to make that transition, you know, stayed in their house and, and, and got it in until they was able to adjust to that those newer techniques. Well, man, you know, all I can say is is... Thank you for spending a little bit of time with us because this is just wisdom being being shared and, and all the cats out there that are trying to be a DJ, uh, this is one of the originals, man. So if you need some real wisdom on how to get it done, this is where you start. Uh, man, I just appreciate you. And, and I, I, I just have one final question to kind of rope it all off. And this is going to this is gonna have you educate the folks out there to what the term DJ really means because we have... These new DJs that are actually producers, they, they're spinning the crowd, you know, they're, and they're great at what they're doing. You got the, the Armin Van Buren's and these big guys that are, they are DJs. But you started in a different era. Do, do you feel like it's the same job or is it something different now? Um, it's the same job. It's, it's different technology. But if you don't apply the right energy into the audience, you're done. And so it doesn't matter what you're working with. 
um, with how you what you use, you know, um, you it's about you know creating the right energy at the right time, feeling the energy of the room, mm -hmm. and knowing when to change, when to bring the tempo up, when to slow it down, you know. Mm. These are all the techniques of a, 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 a disc jockey, a disc mm. jockey. You have, to, you have to ride the floor. You got to know how to ride the audience, the crowd. You got to know when to put, when to whip harder, That's when to whip it, slower. Man. And it's all done <laughs> with your music. Wow. Hence, wow. disc jockey. Well, man, again, I sure do appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Mr. Graham Mixer DST has been an honor. And uh, Thank you, for sir. everybody out there that's chilling out to the segment, please hit us with a share. Share the segment with somebody else. Let somebody else know what we're doing over here at Beautiful Now in the Chasing the Impossible segment. Um, as always, we want to make sure that we keep it positive, uplifting, encouraged, inspiring. So keep those hands washed out there. Stay safe. Get away from this COVID. And we will see you next time at...